I think that Vlad just joined, so good morning, Vlad. Hi, good morning. Because I don't know if I can start. I guess so. No, I fear it is is everything um, right on on your side um, uh, on site. Yeah, we can start. Okay, so Hafa, I'll make a quick introduction and pass it over to you so you can uh, give um, uh, the initial overview. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everyone who uh, is joining us. My name is Paulo. I'm head of uh, Digital Rights uh, in Article 19 Brazil and, and South America. Um, very happy to uh, give you guys welcome to, to this session uh, of the IGF um, 2022. Um, the idea of the session is to discuss who is being left behind by mood stakeholderism uh, and internet governance. Um, we will be um, joined by um, Vladimir Cortez, Najini from IT for Change, Vladimir Cortez from Art Article 19, Mexico, uh, Najini, and Catalina from, from Charisma Foundation. Um, just, uh, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Rafaela Alcantara, so she can make a quick introduction. I'll, I'll be your moderator. I thanks a lot, uh, Afi as well, for being um, the on-site moderator, uh, everyone who has accepted our uh, invitation. And because of the different time zones, I especially thank uh, Vladimir and Catalina Moreno uh, for being um, uh, so early uh, in the morning, uh, joining us from from Mexico and, and Colombia. So uh, thanks a lot. Um, I guess um, I'm sure this will be a, a, a great session. And without further ado, I'll just um, hand it over to my colleague, Rafaela, for a quick uh, overview of the session and then uh, back to me. Um, and then we can pass it over to our, our speakers. So. Welcome, everyone, and thanks a lot, everyone, for, for joining. So, Hafa, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Paulo, for the introduction. Um, I will. I would like to uh, say how much we appreciate your attendance today, your online and on-site attendance. I think that I will share a few thoughts on the idea of the session. Uh, firstly, it's relevant to highlight that the session is connected to our activities that Article 19 has been carrying out together with the different organizations. Uh, with these activities, we try to approach the engagement of groups that, although affected by internet governance policies, are not necessarily engaged in shaping internet policies because they have different duties, mandates, offers, obstacles to do so. Um, in this context, this uh, specific conversation represents a continuity of uh, debate that has been begun in, in a workshop at RightsCon uh, this year, uh, where we approached issues such as indigenous languages and infrastructure, people's empowerment and knowledge on digital rights teams, and the idea of building a multicultural and the colonized internet. And uh, I think that is an example that we can share is something that is, has been happening in Brazil. Uh, this year, we have been following some of piece of news that report that uh, Elon Musk has interests in connecting the Amazon. Uh, he recalled in order to provide internet access to rural schools and to combat illegal deforestation. And this kind of initiative brings us concerns related to the idea that uh, of ignoring 
not only the tools that already in, are already used in the region, but also the context of different groups. Uh, in the in, for instance, indigenous populations that will be affected in the region. So the session aims to get insights, suggestions, and best best practices in order to think how to force the participation and democratization of internet governance, improving the multi-stakeholder scenario this, that is already placed. And we have we have three panelists that kindly accept our invitation to um, speak to you and share their perspectives and experiences in regard to the theme. Uh, and the different panelists intentionally are from different countries throughout the world in order to uh, have a more uh, wider diversity and points of view in this session. And I, I think that Pajay will start to introduce our panelists, we plan to have uh, this order. Firstly, Vladimir Cortes, uh, then Dandini, and um, afterwards, Catalina Moreno. Paje, I think that you want to introduce them. I think that's it. We can go straight. Thank you, Hafa, for the introduction. We can go straight over to, to, to Vladimir. The idea is to have um 10 minutes for each uh, presentation and examples and uh you know sharing sharing ideas in general about the topic that uh, that composes this session uh and then we can have some time to you know have chats and, and and open to the public and so on so again thanks a lot for everyone that is joining us and vladji vladimir um, uh, it's over with you vladimir is head of uh, digital from uh, Article 19, Mexico. But if you want to introduce yourself, you also be um, um, if you feel comfortable with it, be, be our guest. So thanks a lot, Vladi, and welcome. Uh, well, thank you, uh, thank you, Paje, thank you, uh, Rafaela. Uh, yes, I'm Vladimir Cortez. Sorry if I'm not like the brightest person now. It's like three in the morning, uh, but I will like yeah try to do my my best. And uh, first of all, like thank you for everyone also to joining this uh, this session. Uh, those who are on site and those who are also uh, online. I'm Vladimir Cortez. I am the digital rights program officer based in Mexico City, uh, working in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. As an office, we uh, covered uh, here in Mexico and also uh, part of our work in uh, in Central America. I will start uh, this uh, conversation uh, using and, and taking into account one of uh, the pieces of uh, uh, one uh, writer, Jan Art uh, Schultz, which uh, and and just this this using is at, as a, a theoretical uh, framework and and how the academic perspective also interacts with uh, one of the main uh, uh, change or the, the main things that it's it's being it's going to be discussed here and i would love perhaps like raise some questions and raise some uh, like uh, challenges that i somehow like uh, identify uh, first by saying and understanding that there is like a complexity in internet uh, governance on under something that he defines as the polycentric approach uh, in in which there is like an uh, different elements being uh, involved when we're like thinking on, on internet governance uh, not just uh, because of what uh, for example bring us uh, here in the at, at the igf but recognizing uh, different elements also uh, uh, taking part on being part of uh, the uh, uh of of the, the complexity of understanding uh internet governance first like uh, different elements such the trans scalarity of internet governance the trans sectoriality that we uh, all already like uh, it's it's being placed uh, with the different uh, sectors of uh, the private sector the uh, academy uh, the uh, technical community uh, another element uh, considering uh, for example the diffusion of uh, the internet uh, governance and how 
this goes to different and multiple entities, many institutional sites. We have, yes, uh, the Internet Governance Forums, but then we have uh, IEEE, we have the Internet Engineering uh, Task Force, and uh, other entities with, which also like adds uh, some uh, different uh, elements. Uh, another characteristic of uh, what he describes uh, as the internet uh, uh, governance complexity is like the fluidity, how it's like very highly changeable uh, and during the time, how it also like recognizes different uh, uh, ways in which internet governs. It's, it's constantly uh, changing. And uh, another uh, two elements, which uh, I think it's also like uh, relevant when we are like thinking uh, first of where, where we are like being placed. One is the overlapping of mandates, how sometimes like uh, different aspects of, of regulation and when we are thinking about internet governance uh, uh, puts like in different uh, institutions it could be at itu it can be at uh, icon it can be like at different uh, places and finally the ambiguity ambiguity of hierarchies and the absence of uh, a single and coherent uh, supreme authority i think when we start like uh, dividing and, and and looking these different elements of uh, internet uh, governance and these different uh, characteristics it's like uh, first not thinking as as an uh, unite uh, block or as a as a monolith which uh, somehow like uh, give us a uh, 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 a first like flat uh, uh, place to uh, act on the other hand uh, one of the challenges that must be uh, considered uh, by this uh, when we are like uh, having this uh, first characterization it's uh, uh, how internet governance cannot be achieved only by states but a broad and complex regime of multiple actors however uh, and and here it comes like some of the of the particular questions and and what bring us uh, also like to to this uh, discussion uh, it seems that uh, uh, there, when we are like, thinking about uh, internet governance and the biggest challenges that make internet uh, governance, it's how we do this like more democratic. How do we uh, build this in in a more inclusive uh, way, and how we start involving uh, the historically marginalized uh, sectors. That is like even in approaches that involve multi-stakeholder participation, and and sometimes this uh, also can be like super uh, like romantic way of seeing internet governance. And I think at least from civil uh, society and, and civil sector, it's 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 always like a, a way of thinking that uh, the different spaces can really be open. But sometimes just like to pro problematize how. Uh, uh, in in real, we are like uh, thinking of uh, this as as a, as a democratic and as a very inclusive uh, perspective, um, with a broader participation of different sectors in policy making. Sometimes these spaces have been dominated by male, white, English speaking, professional, wealthy people from the global north. So in that sense, uh, uh, the so-called stakeholder democracy can uh, uh, easily become a mechanism of elite privilege that confirms hegemonic uh, power. By recognizing this type of complexity, I believe, is one of the first steps in addressing uh, democratization in the field of action of internet governance. Identifying these areas of opportunity to generate greater involvement of participation of different stakeholders in particular for non-professionals, for people of color, women, uh, youth, not English speakers, people with disability, and other who are rarely uh, being heard in many arenas of internet uh, regulation. Finally, the relevance of counter-hegemonic resistance to the internet governance will also have the impact on uh, this uh, way of uh, being like and, and promote the democratiz democratization of the internet uh, governance. The challenge, of course, uh, will be how to dismantle these political economical structures that also shape the processes of internet uh, governance and reflections 
uh, therefore also points to the structural conditions and the basis of global inequality. Here in Mexico, for uh, many years, we uh, have stopped, for example, uh, having the discussions around the uh, local IGFs. Uh, this means, uh, first, like there, there are like no... Uh, even like debates, the, the even when, when we are like thinking uh, in, a, in a more broader way uh, to discuss like uh, different uh, uh, elements and topics that uh, relates, for example, to digital divide, uh, the, that relates to uh, the power uh, and the monopolies and uh, the uh, digital uh, markets and so on, and. So from the beginning, it's like if we are not having this type of uh, of discussions, then uh, the second uh, phase is like uh, how do we uh, start also like involving those, for example, uh, local projects that are like uh, also like uh, being uh, relevant, and how do we start like thinking of uh, uh, expanding this type of discussion, which sometimes. Uh, uh, and also like to address on this uh, can can get a little bit uh, harder to uh, like starting uh, understanding uh, uh, like the as, as I was like mentioning at the beginning the uh, uh, the complexity so uh, that, that's perhaps like something for 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 the first uh, moment some of the uh, of the reflections like taking into account uh, how uh, we start uh, thinking and start like uh, 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 creating different uh, paths and different ways of uh, expanding more from the local, from the regional and from the international perspective. And I know that uh, at the IGF and at uh, different and uh, in other uh, uh, also like uh, uh, scenarios and, and fora, there have been like different efforts on 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 this, but it's uh, still, I think, uh, a way to uh, like uh, really thinking on uh, that this is going to promote some kind of uh, democratization and the inclusivity of like uh, different uh, groups that uh, already and historic historically have been marginalized. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vlad, for giving us an overview of internet governance bodies and also for offering us your perspective uh, and relevant perspective in regard to the uh, asymmetries and gaps that we have in participation with the comparing Global North and Global South participation. And also thank you for talking a little bit about the context in Mexico. Mexico, uh, which is really relevant, and I think that you mentioning mentioned it on the language in which uh, we speak on uh, in those forums, etc. And uh, I think that we uh, gave us a lot of food for thought to start this session. And now I will uh, pass it over to Nandini Shami uh, from IT for Change. Thank you, Nandini, for joining us. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think that it is wonderful that we are having this uh, critical discussion uh, today on who is being left behind by internet governance. And uh, I will bring some perspectives from the work of my organization, IT for Change. IT for Change is based in Bangalore, India, and we do research and policy advocacy at the intersections of digital technologies and social change. And our mandate is to promote uh, social justice, gender equality, and development justice in the emerging digital uh, economy and society. Uh, like Ladmi began uh, before me, I agree that when we start answering the question of who is being left behind by internet governance, the primary difficulty that we face is in bounding the concept of internet governance. Because with the increasing socialization of the internet and the emergence of frontier platform data and AI technologies, uh, it is evident that we are no longer just talking about the technical cooperation matters in relation to 
to critical internet resources, but we are talking about a range of things, which is about the structures of the new digital economy and society and the institutional data and AI order that is emerging. Uh, one thing that I find promising is that uh, in the new proposed global digital compact as laid out by the UN Secretary General in his Our Common Agenda report, there is a recognition that any type of global digital cooperation solution that we uh, talk about today needs to discuss not just the questions of universal connectivity and technical cooperation on internet matters, but equally the respect and promotion of human rights online, the regulation of AI and the governance of the digital and particularly the data commons and the solution that is proposed about governing the data commons as a global public good. Now, when we look at this agenda before us and we see whether in shaping this agenda, whose voices are taken into account and who is being left behind, uh, typically, I think the conversation tends to focus on representational diversity in IG forums and in the different fragmented policy forums at the global level where data governance gets shaped or the digital trade policy gets set and so on. But I think that we cannot fully answer the question of who is being left behind without actually looking at the ills of equal footing multi-stakeholderism as it is practiced in the mainstream global digital cooperation space uh, today. And here I would just like to reflect on a few things. Uh, there is an analysis of 21 multi-stakeholder initiatives at the global level that has been conducted by Mary Ann Manahan and Madhuresh Kumar in the year 2021. And they point out how most of these initiatives are corporate-led, and this includes the GAFAM, IBM, Intel, and Cisco, telecom companies such as Orange, Huawei, Ericsson, AT&T, Vodafone, e-commerce giants, and cybersecurity providers. And within these 21 multi-stakeholder initiatives in this fragmented space of policy making, it is evident that big tech corporations dominate the various aspects of internet and data governance conversations today. The subject matters concern massive commercial gains and there is a direct conflict of interest. Even more worryingly, none of these single MSIs has focused on the contentious issues of binding rules for data, especially how to govern cross-border data flows, which is the challenge of our time. And this is quite unsurprising as any conversation around this will challenge the heart of data extractivism and digital neocolonialism on which the edifice of big tech power stands today. What is problematic is that even as the ills of equal footing multi-stakeholderism, the evidence abounds all around us, when we look at the proposals in the SG roadmap for digital cooperation, we find more of the same in the solution. For instance, uh, in the SDGs Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, the proposal for a new strategic and empowered high-level multi-stakeholder body that has also come back in the shape of the IGF leadership uh, panel, which is attempting to set a stratification in the categorization of IGF participants into different status-based categories. This actually undermines the forum's original goal of encouraging bottom-up stakeholder participation and uh, civil society coalitions such as the JustNet coalition from the global south have pointed out the risks in these developments of a particular capture of the internet governance space by powerful elite uh, corporate voices and agendas and I think the biggest problem uh, leading to exclusions of the of those who are at the margins from internet governance today is uh, actually the problem of corporate capture of multi-stakeholderism and the gaping democratic deficit at the global level, which we need to actually find solutions to. Now I come to the question of agendas, because we can't actually understand who is being left behind without actually looking at which agendas are getting left out or excluded from the table. So point number one, 
when we talk about digital inclusion most of you may have read about this proposal for the digital development tax that is supposed to uh, enable connectivity for all because the idea is that a fund is created with big tech companies contribution and there will be universal connectivity but the real question we ought to be asking us we are not interested in just connectivity to bring more and more users for big tech companies right we want meaningful participation in digital economy and society so how can workers how can farmers in the global south pursue new platform and data and ai solutions that they own which are embedded contextually in their local economies and run in a public cooperativist model for uh, their own ends and how do we have such democratic development of the next generation digital innovation that is people centric and not big tech centric uh, i think we are not having this critical uh, conversation and we have to put it back there uh, into the conversations in the summit of the future my second point is about the whole conversations and the proposals for ai regulation now i think that when we are talking about a new global ai constitutionalism there is a very dangerous trend that we see especially when you observe this debate from the global south where there is an idea that there can be a cut copy paste of the european model of how to regulate the data and ai economy across the entire world now the eu may have looked at the question of human rights and solved it in one way but in economies in the south for instance when you look at the first generation and second generation human rights and how they intersect in the ai economy the concerns emerge in complex and situated notions and there will be notions about how to straddle autonomy over personal information the realities of shared use of digital artifacts and community identity and different types of contextual interpretations may be needed and we don't really have the room for this in the conversations we are doing right now and most critically when we look at ai and human rights i think 99% of the conversation gets focused on reducing human rights to the civic and political rights we forget that there are second generation rights and there is a third generation right to development so when we are looking at ai and human rights we should actually also be talking about what happens to the right to self determination of the peoples of the global south to claim their data resources to carve out their own auto autonomous pathways to development what happens to economic self determination of peoples and what happens to the neo colonialism that data extractivism has furthered and these voices and these agendas are missing uh, from the picture now i come to my final point in the global digital compact and everywhere if you look in the un system especially within the debates on the committee on food security and the world health organization there is the idea that the data commons has to be governed as a global public good there is a catch here if data is a public good and part of the common heritage of mankind and has to flow freely across borders why is the intelligence that is derived from this global data commons put behind certain intellectual property enclosures we are not talking about dismantling the existing ip rights regime that enables big tech to control critical sectors of the economy and society in perpetuity but we want data to flow freely and then we think that this will lead to an equitable and fair order so there is something missing in the analysis i would say that rather than argue for a global digital public good governance model for data we ought to be looking at a common property resource regime where we understand that data as reified social knowledge belongs to the people and the communities from which it is generated and then we look at some kind of a commons model which recognizes collective economic rights as part of self determination rights over data resources uh and last but not the least uh when uh, again like you know looking at all these facts before us and we want to look at like who is excluded from 
uh, internet uh, governance. Uh, I think that what we need to start doing uh, is that in the internet governance debate, we need to start from uh, what happens to the farmers, workers, and citizens of the global south who may not be users of the internet today, but they are imbricated in the emerging paradigm because they are data points for this big tech apparatus. And then we need to start thinking about structural exclusion. I will just uh, stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nalini. Excellent. I think uh, that you have addressed uh, such important topics that are related to uh, the subjects that we are uh, debating today. I think that uh, your approach connects a lot to Vladimir approach. Uh, and uh, you point out really important topics that show that representation, the lack of participation, uh, goes beyond uh, representation itself only. It's related to the materialities of the concept. It's related to the consequences. And uh, thank you also for approaching the concept of internet governance itself. Itself is something that we have to approach as well, in order to think how wide is our debate. And uh, thank you also for approaching neo-colonialist relationships and the global north and sur relationships and asymmetries and the fact that we need to think about regulation about laws from our territories from our from from the place that we occupy in the world without seeing copy and paste legislation or regulation from the europe thank you so much for that and without further ado i will pass it over to uh, Catalina, that is from uh, Charisma Foundation, that is based in Colombia. Catalina, please, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much, Rafaela. Yes, uh, maybe my 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 space will be a little bit of a repetition of what said before. Uh, the thing is, I brought some examples of what has what has been happening in Colombia right now. So the starting point is the internet uh, as a free and decentralized space one might believe that the internet is not governed by anyone or should not be governed by anyone but we already know that not everything is available to everyone in the same way in practice so someone makes the decisions regarding the internet the internet's technological configuration not only shapes the digital environment but also determines the power of various actors Based on the multi-stakeholder principle, one would think that in forums such as the one we are in, where all the relevant actors for internet decision-making are included is enough. And if any of them are missing, they can be invited. The truth is that governance goes beyond centralized and formalized institutions su such as the ICANN or the Internet Governance Forum IGF. Internet governance, rather than a set of institutions and multilateral formulas for discussions, is a field of dispute around the control and management of technology. Governance is grounded on social coordination, according to Hoffman. This means that governance occurs when routine, routine ways of interacting become problematic and require adjustment, when public criticism flares up, or when established procedures lose legitimacy. These critical moments open temporary windows to the precarious conditions undefining social coordination, which more often than not may be in need of adaptation. Thinking that governance happens in mundane activities allows for real, real uh, coordination with stakeholders. For example, agreements can be reached on the expectation of privacy to be respected by local governments, or on the legitimacy of the moderation of certain types of content by social platforms in times of elections. Internet governance should address issues such as the protection of online privacy and the anonymity of users, the role of private companies that control the internet infrastructure, the roles of states, the responsibility of intermediaries, and of course, freedom of expression. Despite being a tool with huge capabilities to enable the exercise of rights, 
It can be affected by the development of policies that do not take into account its particular characteristics and the point of view of multiple actors. What has happened in Colombia regarding uh, internet governance? What we've seen is that voices and viewpoints of populations directly affected by them do not participate in the debate about digital policies. The government has developed, for example, the first example I brought here is that the government has developed uh, communication surveillance systems and laws. The police have the ability to intercept internet and telephone communication signals. Colombia's security forces and intelligence agency also have direct access to mass internet, internet traffic surveillance capabilities with the ability not only to capture users' communications traffic, but also to take over the target's device, control it, and find everything there is in their vicinity. This technology has been used to monitor the communications of journalists uh, investigating police corruption and human rights defenders. As a second example, there's also evidence that during the protest in the previous years, uh, when the army and police arrived to control the places where people gather, the internet signal was shut down. The outages prevented people from reporting excessive use of force and calling for help th through social media. An administrative regulation allows the use of signal jammers to ensure public safety without any su judicial supervision or prior authorization. The country's history of armed conflict, in which the state has also been the perpetrator of violence, has led to the need for multiple social leaders, journalists, and human rights defenders. They are generally the target of technological decisions by the state. Despite this, they hardly have any voice in internet governance decisions in the local uh, scene. Traditional human rights organizations lack a specific and technical training on digital rights, so they would not have a maybe um, technical voice to express if they were uh, to go to these spaces. Both cases are now, these both cases that I just mentioned are now in the hands of judges, the Inter-American Court and the Constitutional Court of Colombia waiting for a decision. My third example would be like uh, the digitization of the multiple state services uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic. Right now, we saw that the debate in the in Congress on the permanence of digital justice only took into account the vision of lawyers and judicial officials who can easily connect to the internet and who have equipment to do so. No one took into account the people who do not have any internet connection or knowledge of technology. In an investigation, we saw how notifications to attend a hearing arrived a day before to indigenous communities who did not have any energy in their places or speak Spanish. Some decisions were made in the debate to address this digital divide, but they were not the focus despite being in a country with profound differences in access to internet. As, an ex as a last example, I would like to mention the way in which traditional human rights organizations interact with social platforms. For the organizations, they, they are a space for disseminating their work. However, in a research we did recently, it, it was shown to us that due to the political content they publish, they constantly suffer of content moderations on due content moderations. In addition, they also suffer shadow banning and they did not understand how content was being less or more visible in some cases. As a response, uh, like I told you, I want to focus on my local contest. I believe uh, that to meet these challenges, civil society must raise with stakeholders, platforms and states the cost of making decisions behind the back of public interest. It must seek avenues to challenge negotiations. It must litigate changes and mobilize people to demand them. This bottom-up perspective focuses on the mutual adjustments we make in our daily life, in our daily social life. Instead of centering on laws and regulatory structures and enforcement measures, governance as a coordination highlights the day-to-day -day practices. First of all, traditional organizations must be aware of the challenges of digital environments in their work and daily lives. Although most of their work takes place in territories, what happens in the, on the internet also matters. Civil society must be attentive to legislative and judicial and administrative de developments that affect the internet in order to seek effective participation and consolidate its place as an interlocutor with relevant authorities in the creation and implementation of policies. 
This in turn should go in hand with advocacy actions based on research and in line with local needs and international debates on the internet. Civil society must also promote and expand local, re re regional, and international support networks to amplify its voice in the defense of human rights in the digital spaces and pool efforts and knowledge on issues shared among countries. Authorities also have some obligations. They should develop and implement models of participation that take into account the views of different groups interested in the internet, such as civil society, academia, and technical community. Broadening the discussion to these groups will increase the legitimacy of the policies to be implemented to regulate internet. As I said before, some internet governance issues are being decided by the judges, so judicial capacity should be strengthened, especially in relationship to uh, understanding the internet so that a line of judicial interpretation is consistent with human international human rights standards applicable to the internet. That would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much as well, Catalina. I think that you brought, you shared some specific topics and approaches that help us a lot in thinking about the subject. Uh, thank you for sharing the context in Colombia. I think that it is really important to get to know uh, the scenario in the country, especially considering the social protests that you have mentioned that were carried out over the last years in the country. Uh, the thing about surveillance and authorities is also really relevant to bear in mind when we debate uh, internet governance and also the advocacy strategies uh, the strategic litigation issues are are also really important because um, it's the kind of thing that we also carry out in Brazil and other countries. So thank you so much for sharing this. I think that uh, all interventions, all uh, the, the, all the topics that uh, your you as speakers have raised are complementary and really important to have a wider perspective and debate on the uh, the subject that, that we have been trying to address today. And I would like to ask Afi, Afi uh, that is kindly helping us on site. I don't know if uh, we have some on site intervention right now, because we would like to um, debate a little bit with attendees. Uh, if attendees would like to raise questions or share best practice related to engagement of different groups, internet debates will be more than happy to listen to those inputs. And uh, we also here to listen to and to interact with online uh, attendees as well. Uh, I don't know if you have on-site uh, on interventions? Yes, I have one. Yeah. Ah, great. Please go ahead. Thank you. Joseph Noll from the University of Oslo and the Basic Internet Foundation. I, I very much appreciate your, your inputs to the different policies. Uh, I, I would just ask you and perhaps comment on the challenge of really connecting everyone on earth which for me is the first starting point before we talk about uh, the other starting points so in the relation of policies versus capability of access uh, do you really believe that our current internet is going to reach out to rural areas in the global south Uh, I have another one. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Waisi Yao uh, from Nigeria. Um, often the discussion about internet governance uh, seems to focus more on t getting people on the table but overlooking the fact that when people are on the table, what they say is informed by their own experience and participation 
in technology production and uh, youths. In Africa, uh, governments, civil society, and private sector, our participation is constrained. Uh, we are not involved in the production of technology. Um, we are merely consumers of devices that are produced in other parts of the world. And so a people, private sector in those countries, uh, US, uh, China, et cetera, you know, uh, can participate effectively because they are key players. They produce the technology. Our private sector is completely outside of this discussion. Our governments are not fully knowledgeable about the production systems and so forth. And so in that context, in fact, there is the tendency that digital divide is profitable for other actors. And therefore, whatever discussion we do, it will not substantively address the issue of the gaps. I think that we have to find a way in which we can democratize the issue of technology production and not just the issue of consumption because much of the discussion we do is about access and use and not about how countries in developing uh, in the global south can own and reproduce um, technology. So I'm wondering how that differential in terms of participation impact on the substantive decisions and formats that um, uh, get out of the uh, various discussion about uh, global governance of the internet. Thank you. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Arnaldo from Brazilian Youth Delegate, and I'd like to make a comment about the exactly the construction and participation in the debates from an intersectional uh, perspective which permeates not only the construction of poverty and inequality in the North and South uh, slash East and West context, but also in the understanding of those who participate in the procedures that builds the bases and rules for GY. Um, intersectionality in this case could be applied in the perception that there are inequalities in the face of representations, which as a rule, exclude people by virtue of their color, gender, and sexuality, um, and make the processes only represented by a perspective that analyzes the privilege, privileged space of men, white, cis, and from the global north, making the figure um, of especially black women not aligned to cis normativity through a perspective of social binarism invisible. In my view, those are those who are left aside are those poles that do not align with the cis hetero white male normative that is highlighted in the decision making flows, and I believe that there is need that these needs to be worked for the development of a more plural internet and accessible for everyone. And as a matter of fact, I want to see the opinion of you on the this space building. And how do you see the, the space of intersectionality on the building of a new um, proposal of a new take of um, multisexual, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, multisexual uh, space in internet? Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, there's no more question for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your interventions. We have a lot to think about. We don't um, have the expectation of being exhaustive <laughs> within our one hour section. <laughs> Actually, the, uh, it's, a, it's a debate that should be uh, carried out also afterwards. And thank you so much for your interventions. I would like to only check if we have uh, 
someone that is participating online here that would like to to raise anything, to ask some question, to share anything. Um, if don't, I think that we can pass it over to our speakers. It's a one hour session, so, so we have nine minutes. I'm sorry for that. Um, and uh, I think that uh, our speakers can uh, react and share with the perspectives, uh, be reminded uh, as the questions that were raised and also share a few final words related to the participation here, just to, I don't know, sorry <laughs> about that, but I think that's the best way to finish. So I will uh, pass it over to Catalina right now, please. <laughs> Okay, maybe I will address just a question regarding the um, digital divide and the regional areas, if they can be effectively connected. That's, that's the goal. I mean, what I believe is that's the goal. And related to the topic of this uh, panel, what I would say is that the decisions regarding their connection should be addressed by them. I mean, they should have a boat there. So that would be like my main take. I mean, that's the goal. In Colombia, it is said to be completed by 2030. It, it is still like so far away. So right now they depend on just mobile connections and really slow connections and net neutrality uh, this kind of policy, zero rating uh, uh, policies to get their connection so yeah the goal is that one we don't know if it's gonna be real but they should be taken into account when making decisions and also the impacts of policy regarding the digitalization of services should take into account also this digital divide so that would be like my take on all the questions that were asked Okay, great. Thank you so much, Catalina. And uh, I will, without further ado, uh, I think that, that I think that I will pass it over to Nandini to share uh, a few words and impressions that you have, please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, two quick points uh, on the comment that the divide that we should be talking about is not the divide in access to connectivity but it's about the divide in the digital infrastructural capabilities and production power. I couldn't agree more. I think that's the conversation we should be having and we should be looking at uh, how to effectively use official development assistance routes to build digital economies that are autonomous in the global south and how the rules should enable the economic uh, development for human flourishing in the global south. Uh, I also had a quick second uh, point uh, in response to the uh, comment from the representative from the Brazilian youth uh, delegation. I absolutely agree that when we are talking about technological design, uh, we should ensure that we are not like going with the mainstream uh, white cis heteronormative perspectives that get hegemonized. At the same time, I just have a caution that it's very, very easy today for digital capitalism to co-opt the politics of diversity and feminist activists from the South have long warned how, you know, you see this rainbow capitalism where you will get a pride march doodle or a photo filter, but when it comes to effective accountability for gender-based hate or actually standing up for women's rights, corporations are not going to be there. So uh, in terms of like how to further a progressive politics of gender, I think we have to be very clear that the market is not an easy ally or like, you know, an unmixed ally. So I'll just stop with that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nandini. And I will uh, pass it over right now to Vlad that may share the, uh, his impressions on the questions and the uh, impressions shared. Thank you. Uh, and I really appreciate all the, the comments from uh, those who are on, on site. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, questions and, and reflections and comments. Uh, I will just like uh, perhaps leave a small, uh, my 
be a little bit controversial ab around digital divide, but also like ask, uh, and, and that's something that we are saying here in Mexico, those who doesn't will and, and doesn't want to be connected. When we are thinking about digital divide, there's like this idea that everyone has to be connected and that everyone and the rural uh, uh, communities have to be connected. And sometimes perhaps it's like just slowing down and, and thinking about like the the way they, they want and indigenous communities, for example, in, in Mexico and, and, and other type of communities, they are like thinking about internet and thinking about being uh, connected and thinking about like uh, taking part also in this uh, more like broader discussions around internet governance, because that's the first like steps about like how they are imagining and why they're imagining to be connected in terms of their needs, in terms of their like beliefs, in terms of their cosmovision, if they're in terms of like their uh, linguistic and cultural approaches. So that's uh, like uh, for just like to to slightly uh, have like a different perspective and finally and and, and relates to to the last two, two comments definitely there is a, a, a way of thinking from the global south in terms of the counter hegemonic resistance that it's like a vital sign for uh, a robust democracy and i also like uh, share the points of nandini like pointing out it's not just like about inclusivity and in, in terms of like bringing those voices uh, but uh, in terms of the agendas that uh, we are uh, seeing and that are like uh, being, being, being in place from labor movements, from feminist uh, contestations, from anti-colonial struggles, from uh, demonstrations, from like different uh, perspectives. And the final uh, thing, I think intersectionality, it's uh, something that uh, should also like uh, uh, being putting in, in place and, and, and having like uh, this conversations again not just like by bringing those voices but actually thinking on uh, these uh, movements to dismantle it somehow like uh, as is it was like mentioned the economical powers and uh, and other forms that dominates uh, part of the uh, of the conversations thank you yes uh, thank you so much for your interventions i would like to Take this opportunity to take it, uh, those final <laughs> minutes to uh, thank you so much. Thank you, the attendees, for the intervention, for being here today. Thank you, our speakers, for sharing such important inputs because uh, I think that uh, the problem uh, shows itself like a complex one. And we have to think about, uh, we have to think beyond uh, simple relationships between big packs and consumers. We have a lot to think because intersectionality is something that goes beyond uh, only participation and maybe uh, some in participation that is not main meaningful. And we also have to think from the territories and not from the companies and from what the companies are imposing in regard to connectivity, in regard to the internet. It was a really great uh, session. Thank you so much for the perspectives that you have shared. Uh, they will help us a lot in our work as well and remain at your disposal for anything. And on behalf of Article 19 Brazil, I'd like to thank you all and uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> I think that we should end right now because uh, the time <laughs> we are facing the one hour that we have. And thank you so much. And we keep in touch. I hope it was really meaningful for us. Obrigado. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Sofia. <laughs> thank you, Sofia.